So what I'm showing you a picture of here is uh, one of the classics of French art, a painting called The Raft of the Medusa by Theodore Géricault. I assume that's how his name is pronounced. I'm not an expert. But it's uh, a romantic masterpiece that depicts a true story. There was a wreck of a French naval vessel which uh, nearly everybody that was on board died, um, a real disaster. There were just 15 survivors out of about 150 on board the ship. And uh, in the painting, the survivors are pictured floating aboard this raft, this makeshift raft that has begun to run aground. And if you look, uh, those who are in the foreground of the painting look like you would expect people who've been through a disaster to look. Um, they're near death, they are injured, they appear to be in shock and so forth. Their facial expressions don't show a lot of hope. But in the background of the painting, on the other side of the raft, notice the difference. Um, there are um, a few there whose faces you cannot see, but just by their postures, you can see that they're much more engaged and alert and energized, seemingly. In fact, they're looking out toward the horizon, and it seems like they're almost waving at something. Maybe they've seen their possible salvation. Uh, maybe another ship uh, come to rescue them from the predicament they're in. So it's an interesting painting. It's sort of a study in contrasts and a comparison of perspectives. Um, you know, perspectives being hope versus dismay, um, cheer versus depression, faith versus unbelief. And so it reminds us of the importance of our outlook on life. How, how valuable is a good perspective on things? Well, in this series of videos, we're going to study together uh, from the character Nehemiah. Uh, the book of Nehemiah, of course, tells his story in the Old Testament. And uh, one thing that made Nehemiah a great servant of God was his perspective. Uh, he had the perspective, the outlook of a builder. And so, you know, if, if you think about builders, uh, maybe you know somebody that has built houses or other structures all their life, they probably have a different perspective on some things than the rest of us. You know, we look at an empty field, uh, maybe a rocky, muddy field, and that's what we see. But that person can look at it and see something developed there. They, they might see a beautiful dwelling place, a house. We see a swamp. They might see a city park, depending on their expertise. Um, I'm reminded the years that, that I worked with Mid-Ohio Valley Work Camp. One of the things I got to do, one of my jobs early on, was to select the houses that were going to be painted each summer. And... Uh, Basically, what I would do in the months leading up to work camp was to drive around the county, uh, in Wood County and Washington, Wood County, West Virginia, Washington County, Ohio, and just look for houses that needed a paint job. And really, I'd do that year round. Uh, it took a long time to 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 find enough houses to paint, and it it, it got to the point that no matter where I was. Even if I was way off in another state someplace, when I drove by properties, I'd often think uh, that would make a great work camp house. Um, I had just developed that perspective. It became ingrained in me no matter where I was. And it really took a while to get over that. Um, but that's sort of what I'm, I'm pointing at. Perspective, the perspective of, of a builder. That's Nehemiah. Um, we're going to talk more in coming lessons about who Nehemiah was, a little of his biography, 
uh, some of the details of his life. But uh, for now, I just want us to get his perspective above all else, the perspective of a builder. Uh, I'm going to read some from Nehemiah chapter 1, uh, first chapter of Nehemiah. And, uh, you know, God, I think, has something really important for for all people. In, in these pages, and it begins with having the right outlook, the right perspective on things, and that is this perspective of a builder. So if we start in a really good place, that's that's the beginning, verse 1, just reading three verses here at the beginning of the book. It starts this way, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislef, in the twentieth year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. So the story really begins with two characters. You have, of course, Nehemiah, and then a brother of his, uh, this guy named Hanani. And uh, in these two, we see the examples of the two perspectives that we started with in that French painting. Um, Hanani brings this depressing news. Uh, about Jerusalem, um, the city of David, the city of God. It's in shambles. It had been destroyed, and uh, really it was wrecked in every way. It wasn't even really a city anymore, at least in the way you thought of cities in the ancient world. Um, if you didn't have walls in the ancient world around your city, you didn't have a city. And Jerusalem's walls had been destroyed almost a century and a half before this time period. And they had never been rebuilt. And so the people in Jerusalem that remain, they're living in a desperate situation. They're surrounded by trouble. They are ashamed and depressed, no doubt, downcast. And so that's the news that Hanani brings and reports to Nehemiah. It's sort of his perspective on things. Um, so if you imagine the painting again, uh, Han and I, if he was in the painting of the shipwreck, he'd be languishing in the foreground, uh, sort of hopeless and helpless. Um, well, this, this report, this perspective troubles Nehemiah as well. I mean, it's not like he's immune to the bad news. If you, you read on in the next verse, verse 4, it says, Nehemiah says, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days and continued, I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Uh, Nehemiah is a realist. He knows a bad situation when he sees one. And so he's affected by it. And the bad news from Jerusalem uh, affects him for several days. But I notice, I, I detect a difference, and it's a significant one. And the difference is in his ultimate perspective. I think I see here the perspective of a builder, because Nehemiah is not content to just mourn, to cry. Um, although there's certainly nothing wrong with his shedding tears, or if we're in a situation similar are shedding tears uh, when we see bad things, when we see tragedy. But Nehemiah is not content to just do that, uh, just, just to mourn. Jesus, remember, said, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Uh, Nehemiah is not just going to cry, but he, he sets out, he says, in chapter 1 verse 4 to pray and so he turns to God uh, with purpose and he seeks the face of God and the prayer is really beautiful prayer it's recorded 
here in the first chapter. Again, um, we're going to talk more about this man of prayer in a future broadcast. But, but if you listen to this prayer, especially listen for the perspective. What's his outlook as he's thinking about these things and communicating his, his thoughts to God? Prayer begins in, in verse 5 of Nehemiah chapter 1. He says this, And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people, the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We've acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, Though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Um, I hope you can sort of get a feel for the perspective of this man, the outlook of, of a builder, someone for whom it was not enough just to worry, not enough to fret, um, not enough just to sit and wish things were different, but someone for whom the horizon beckoned, who was looking out for the blessing of God on his people. And indeed, he expected salvation and deliverance to come. That's Nehemiah. Um, and and oh, oh, for the perspective of Nehemiah the builder, to have that perspective, the builder of the walls of Jerusalem. And oh, for the ability to look upon a problem, a disappointment, a disaster, maybe even a pandemic, and to look at it like this man did. And Nehemiah's prayer had a purpose. He had something in mind to do with God's blessing. And um, how do I know that? Because, really because of the only part of that first chapter that we didn't read. Um, it's the very last phrase of chapter 1 of Nehemiah. After he's closed his prayer, he says this, Now I was cupbearer to the king. See, Nehemiah was a high official in the court, in the government of the king of Persia, King Artaxerxes. And so, uh, you know, there were very few people other than the king who would have had more influence in the most powerful nation on the face of the earth at the time. Uh, Persia dominated the world. Few people had more power in that nation than Nehemiah. And uh, again, remember the last phrase of Nehemiah's prayer that's in verse 11. He asked God to grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now, let's think about that little portion of the prayer. Grant who mercy? Well, he's asking God to grant him mercy, that is Nehemiah. And in the sight of what man? Well, in the sight of the king of Persia. Most, most powerful man on the planet at the time. Nehemiah, you see, had a plan. He had something in mind. And 
with that, he had the perspective of a builder. Um, we will talk in the future about um, more details of what that plan was and how God helped him and so forth. But, but for now, I think what's really important is to make sure we have a grasp on this guy's outlook. You see, Nehemiah is looking to the horizon with hope. Um, here he's got a job, he's employed by the great king on the earth, and, and yet he believes in a God in heaven who is infinitely greater and more powerful. That is a great perspective to have. What a wonderful outlook that Nehemiah has. And when I think about that, sometimes comparison with myself, it shames me. Um, my perspective, my outlook at times in comparison with that really fails. Sometimes I'm more like the people on, on the back of that raft in the painting, uh, defeated, depressed, discouraged, and, and all the time missing what God is sending us in the distance, you see. Uh, maybe you can identify with that. Maybe that's a struggle for you, too. Do you ever have that perspective? Um, it, it, it's something to acknowledge, and it's something really to repent of if we're, if we're people of faith, because faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Remember that definition of faith, great faith chapter of the New Testament, Hebrews 11, being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That is faith. And another phrase from, from Hebrews is, without faith, it's, it's impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must not only believe that he exists, but also that he rewards those who seek him. Well, there's one more little scene from early in, in the story of Nehemiah, and, and that'll be it for now. It comes at the end of chapter 2. Um, by the end of chapter 2, Nehemiah has made the journey to Jerusalem from Persia. It's probably about a four-month journey in that world. And so he's uh, traveled a long way, and he's meeting with a group of the, the poor citizens of Jerusalem that are living in these awful conditions, uh, run down, former city, uh, threats on every side, you see. And what I'd like you to notice as, as we read one more text here is the, um, again, the perspective of Nehemiah and how influential for good his faith perspective is, his perspective of a builder, um, how influential that can be on people, even in desperate circumstances. So reading a few verses again from chapter 2, beginning at verse 17, listen to his conversation with the, the, the citizens of, of the, the former Jerusalem. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. But when Sandalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what's this thing you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper, and we, his servants, will arise and build, 
but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. Do you see what happened when, when Nehemiah pointed their eyes away from their problems for a moment and toward God's horizon? It was the people, the citizens of Jerusalem that said, let us rise up and build. That wasn't, that, that, those weren't the words of Nehemiah. Um, they took the initiative to speak those words of commitment. Let us rise up and build. God's hand is upon us. Let us rise up and build. Even if our enemies, our opponents make fun of us, um, we're, we will rise up and build. The enemy may hate us, but by the power of God, let us build. That's a great rallying cry. And for whatever situation we may be in our life that requires building or rebuilding, what a, what a motto to have. So let's think about strengthening our hands for whatever work might be necessary. And let us seek God's face and trust his promises and be ready to ignore critics and skeptics and enemies and to overcome our own failures and stumbles because we'll make mistakes along the way. But let us rise up and build. And let's have this perspective where we're sort of looking out on the horizon and, and searching for what God is sending our way. Searching for his deliverance, his salvation. Can you see it as you look? Those are the eyes of faith. And it's one of the great things that we learn from this man, Nehemiah, from so long ago. Hope that has whet your appetite enough that you'll come back uh, next time and, and take part in this series of lessons on this great man from the past. Um, may God be with you, and may you be his servant faithfully in these days.